So uh, let me begin by introducing myself. I'm Alan Barrett, Director uh, of the ESRI, and it's a pleasure to welcome everybody this morning to this webinar, webinar uh, where we're launching a new study, uh, Origin and Integration, a study of migrants in the 2016 uh, Irish Census. So as many of our old friends will know, um, we've had a, a, a collaboration with the Department of Justice and Equality for a number of years now, where we've done a, a range of studies under a joint research program. Uh, immigrants have been an important uh, component uh, of that overall research program and what we'll be talking about today then is the, uh, the, the latest report uh, using CSO data uh, to try and understand more about the lives and experiences of immigrants in Ireland. So typically when we've uh, launched these studies we've followed a, a particular format and um, so we've always sort of tried to have a, a, a sort of an event uh, around it and obviously we're doing this uh, virtually today. So with that, it's um, a pleasure to be able to say we're joined by Minister David Stanton, and Minister Stanton was a, a regular visitor uh, to the SRI in the, in the uh, pre-COVID era. Uh, so uh, we, we miss not having David uh, lie with us and you know having a chat on the, on the fringes of, of the meetings, but it, it's great that he, he's come along. So uh, when I'm finished in a minute or two, I'll hand over to David and he'll say some words uh, about the study. Then uh, the lead author of the study, uh, my colleague Fran McGinnity, uh, will take you through a presentation uh, going through the, the highlights. And obviously we're looking forward to that. Now, delighted also to say uh, Thomas Liebig, uh, who is a senior migration specialist with the OECD, Thomas is joining us as well and will give a response uh, to, to the study. And then Salome Mbuga, uh, who's with Akidwa and is also a commissioner with the Irish Human Rights and Equality uh, Commission, uh, Salome will give a, a response as well. At the very end of the event then, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you just keep in mind at the bottom of your screen, I think you're all probably getting used to this now, if you just hover your uh, cursor, there's a Q&A function, uh, questions will come uh, through uh, and I'll try and, and moderate anyway the discussion uh, at that stage. So, I mean, I, I think at, at any point in time, discussions of migrants are always really, really important. Uh, but I suppose there are two like major things happening uh, on the news at the moment, COVID and, and riots in the United States. And I think in, in the case of both, uh, you can see very, very clear um, relevance uh, to the topic that we're going to be talking about today. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing some of those themes may emerge as we, uh, as we go through the discussion. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Minister Staunton now. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you, uh, Minister, in this slightly strange uh, circumstance, but we'll, we look forward to hearing your words on, on the study. So over to you, David. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan. And again, uh, happy to join you. And uh, I think I saw somebody send up a message up and I go, they're missing the buns and the coffee, but anyway, maybe in over time we'll have all that. Uh, yeah, look, it, this is a hugely important uh, piece of research. Um, the, this report, a study of migrants in the 2016 hour census, hugely important. And it's very rich in detailed insights into the processes, the challenges, the outcomes of migrant integration. I want to congrat congratulate Fran and her team uh, in, in the ESRI for your work on this. Um, and, and as you said, it does form part, Alan, of the Institute's Equality and Integration Research Program. Uh, which is funded by my department, uh, Department of Justice and Equality, under the Migrant Integration Strategy. And the Migrant Integration Strategy you know, is, is, is ongoing. It's a, a very, very important strategy. You're all very familiar with it, uh, Blueprint for the Future. Um, so this research program began in 2017, and it provides very important, independent, scientifically robust evidence for integration policy. And without the science, as we keep hearing about COVID, science is so, so important. And it's the same here. It's hugely important. Um, the avail availability of this evidence is critical to the design of effective policies and programs to address barriers to integration. Um, Ireland's, our, for our integration strategy that I just mentioned is in its final year. It sets so out a vision uh, in which migrants are facilitated to play a full role in Irish society, where integration is a core philosophy of Irish life and where Irish society institutions work together to promote integration and inclusion. And that's what we all want. Um, to uh, help us to uh, assess our program towards that vision, we need reliable, objective information um, on integration outcomes to be publicly available. So we have a proper debate out there. And so I warmly welcome this report because of that. We have to have evidence and we have to have something that we can really go on. <clears throat> um, one of my children a number of years ago, I'm here in a small room in my house where I do this kind of work. And one of my children had this sign. He's grown up now and gone away, but he had this sign up on the wall. And I, I thought it was 
relevant. It says people come into our lives for a reason, for a season, for life. And, and you know what? It just struck me. Is, is there something in this karma? When we are talking about something like this today, integration, inclusion, and that's on the wall. And I'm looking at it. And I said, I just shared it with you because I thought it was quite poignant. And the bit for life, I think, is something that we have to take, take note of as well. Um, the Irish society now enjoys great diversity of nationality and ethnicity. Almost 12% of the population are non-Irish nationals, while about 17% of us were born outside the state. And again, when you dig down into that, there's a huge wealth of detail. So it's important for us to understand that detail, as well as the importance of evidence-informed policymaking in the areas of integration, inclusion, and anti-discrimination. We also need to be able to counter rumor and misperception with fact and informed discussion. Good policy on, in, on the integration of our migrant communities require good evidence of how they're actually faring, how they're getting on. This study examines key indicators of integration by country of birth for the first time, using census microdata by kind permission of the central uh, statistics office, we thank them for their help. This data allows us to gain new insights into the ways that integration journeys differ depending on their point of origin. Data on English language skills, educational attainment, employment status, and occupational attainment are analyzed by country of birth and compared uh, to data on the Irish born population to build up a detailed picture of integration outcomes and how they vary across different groups. There is much to be encouraged by in the findings. Very a lot of positive stuff in there. In particular, when looking at the employment rates of non-Irish nationals, it is encouraging to see that most migrants to Ireland are playing an active role, contributing to the Irish economy and society. With respect to education, also encouraging to see that immigrant studies, or immigrant students, sorry, uh, achieve similar scores to Irish students in many areas. These results do more than provide an indication of where migrants are faring well in Ireland. They also demonstrate the contributions that migrants are making to Ireland. We can celebrate the, these contributions and recognize the role of national, ethnic, and cultural diversity in shaping the future of this country. So it's important to get that positive news out there, the role that uh, migrants are playing in Irish society, in our economy, and hopefully when our economy is up and running again, uh, the, the continuing role they will play. And I must also recognize the role that migrants have played during this, this uh, COVID crisis in caring roles uh, in particular, and right in, in, in medicine and in volunteering, in community work, right across the board. You know, we, we've all worked together. But there's also, of course, evidence of findings that are less positive. The, the report identifies clear areas of concern for us to consider. Integration outcomes are far from consistent across migrant groups by countries of origins. And this is why my department wanted to get this research done. We want to know where we can do better. One important finding presented in its report is that those with poor English language skills have a higher risk of unemployment and are less likely to be in professional or managerial jobs. Improving English language proficiency and assisting those with poor proficiency are central themes of the migrant integration strategy. That's a huge challenge. We are working with our colleagues in the Department of Education and Skills, SOLAS and the Education and Training Boards across the country to prioritize these actions and ensure real progress over the remainder of the strategy period. And this is one example of where integration policy requires cooperation across multiple government departments and agencies. So a lot to be done there. And it's an ongoing challenge. The more people that come into the country with poor language skills, the challenge keeps, keeps on going. And I've met people in, in, my, in my travels across the country and visiting various places and meeting migrants and people that come to my office and colleagues as well have the same. And quite in interestingly, sometimes it's the children and the families that act as the interpreters when they meet because the adults may, may not have the language or very, very poor language skills. And the children pick up the language so, so quickly. So, but there's a lot to be done there. Another important finding relates to the recognition of migrants' qualifications. In cases where specific skills and, and qualifications are not recognized, some migrants may find themselves working in jobs for which they are overqualified even if they are highly educated. Not only does this result in poorer outcomes for the individual concerned, it also means poor outcomes for Irish life, as potential skills are being underutilized in the Irish labor market. Having a job is a key to successful integration. It provides so much more than an, an income, important though that is. And again, when so many people are off their place of work at the moment, this is coming to the fore more and more. Workplaces connect people. At people, we meet colleagues, we meet customers, we meet clients, and most importantly, we meet friends and we make friends. 
Workplaces are the source of many lasting friendships. Time spent at work allows people to form networks, to participate in the society around them, and often to develop a stronger sense of belonging to the community in, in which they work. It is therefore vital that members of our newer communities can get good jobs and progress within those jobs. They should not only be able to do so free from discrimination, but be actively encouraged to participate in society through work. This is one of the reasons behind recent policy changes we have made to broaden labour market access, for example, to spouses of critical workers and to self and asylum seekers. And I would be anxious to reduce the amount of time that asylum seekers have to wait from the nine months to the six, to six months. That's something I'd really like to do. And I'd be encouraging the next government to do that. The report highlights two particularly vulnerable groups in Irish society. Those who have come through the international protection system experience particular difficulties getting into the labour market here in Ireland. This suggests these vulnerable people might need additional supports. The European Community's Reception Conditions Regulations 2018, which came into effect in June 2018, mean that asylum applicants who have not received a first instance decision within nine months may apply for permission to, uh, to access the labour market. And again, I'd like to bring that down to six months. Worryingly, today's report shows that the black ethnic group is not performing as well in terms of unemployment and career progression. Findings such as this must, must push us to ask ourselves, are we doing enough? What barriers exist that prevent members of this group from gaining access to work and opportunities? And how can we address those barriers? This is why I sought and obtained the agreement of the government to establish an independently chaired anti-racism committee. And only yesterday I spoke with the chairman of that committee and with officials in my department. And I, 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 I'm a bit um, frustrated that it hasn't actually happened to, to know, but I, I've asked that this committee be up and running straight away. I think there was a bit of a hiatus until the new government was formed. But I've asked if you do now because it's hugely, hugely important. I was at the, the CERD, UN CERD, in December. And again, they stressed the importance of this. Um, so uh, this committee, which I, I've asked to be established very soon now, and a lot of work has been done on it, it's almost ready to go, will feature represent representation from employer groups, from civil society and public bodies to review and make recommendations on strengthening the government's approach to combating racism building on the actions currently included in the migrant integration strategy. And, and again, as, as, as Alan said at the start, um, we, we're, we're daily and reminded in, 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 by news reports from the United States that racism is a whole of society problem and it requires a whole of society response with clear government leadership. So everyone has a part to play. And you know, sometimes people come up to me and they say, I'm not racist, but, and off they go. And I've been um, you know, in those discussions and having those debates and having those um, arguments for the last couple of years, last four years, you know, doing the best we can to push out the boat in this one. No one should be excluded on grounds of race, nationality or ethnicity from full acknowledgement, acceptance and participation in Irish life and society. Nor should a person's race, nationality or ethnicity be any barrier to them reaping the many rewards that come from making a full and active contribution to the Irish nation of which they are a part. The new committee will consult widely in drawing up proposals for a new anti-racism strategy for Ireland for the consideration of the government. And I look forward to starting its, its work very, very soon. We have also received 3,800 written submissions on hate speech and hate crime. As you know, we started that last October. It ran until January of public consultation. There were seven workshops held as well. And that's hugely important that we, we, we also work in the area of hate speech and hate crime. Um, I look at this in two ways. I look at it encouraging and supporting inclusion, but we also have to have the, the pointy end at combating racism, hate crime and hate speech as well. So again, this is where good, good evidence is so, so important. High quality um, research like that contained in the report I'm launching today greatly assists in identifying the areas and issues that require most attention. It helps us to target resources where they are most needed. But good research can do much more than this. By generating insight and improving our understanding, it allows us to shape better policy, to mold initiatives and interventions to fit. And you know, we can all now use this research in our debates, in the Dáil, in the Shannon, and in, in public. Uh, when people come up with misconceived ideas and false information, uh, to use that term fake news, we have the research here. This is one of a number of um, pieces of research that the Israel have done for us. And I've been using that research and others as well to formulate policy. And I hope the new government and the new ministers will actually take this on board and carry on with it. There's a lot to be done. Um, on, on the area of um, 
of, of other stuff that's happening. I, I did welcome earlier on this year the, the Garda Diversity and Integration Strategy that Garda launched. Again, that was part of the uh, migrant integration strategy. And we'll probably have to start thinking about developing a new strategy now because this one will be running out at the end of the year. So we'll just have to start a new one and, and see how this, how this one went. It, funding is also important, of course. And we, we have the, the, um, uh, the AMF funding. Last October, 4.5 million was made available there. Um, we have the um, Community Integration Fund. And again, earlier, uh, last, late last year, I launched the Community Sponsorship Ireland, where we, we help, we bring in refugees and communities can play their part in um, supporting refugees across the country. So this is complex, it's multifaceted. A lot of good stuff going on, a lot of challenges. We need to know about these challenges and uh, we need to be able to work on them. So finally, just remind, it remains for me to thank and congrat congratulate Dr. McGinnity and our colleagues who have carried out this extensive piece of research. And I'm really confident, as I said, it will provide a very valuable resource for all of those working in the field of integration. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you next. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much for that, uh, Minister. Really appreciated your uh, remarks. And actually, I think we all welcome everything you said about racism. Um, again, if we were doing this maybe two or three weeks ago, it wouldn't have been quite the focus. Um, but when I was, I saw the report a few weeks ago, uh, but when I took it out again over the last couple of days, one of the first things I went to were the, the, the figures about black unemployment and black disadvantage uh, in Ireland. And I mean, obviously, there's no way you want to sort of compare or whatever, draw the situation in the United States and Ireland, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's, it's really important that we're very, very conscious uh, of our own record in Ireland on, on race-related uh, issues and that uh, we do everything in our power uh, to make sure that we avoid uh, some of the horrors uh, that, that we're seeing elsewhere. So thanks again so, so much. Thank your son too, by the way, for the, uh, the vote. I hope you got his permission uh, to, 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 uh, to show it to the world. But anyway, that, that was really good of you. Um, I, are you going to stay with us for a little while, Minister, or have you to run off? Oh, great. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear what other people have to say, so I'm, 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 I'll be able to stick around. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay. Well, listen, that's very good. If you need to drop out, obviously, we'll, we'll understand that, but great, uh, great if you can stay with us. Okay. So with that, then, uh, it's a pleasure then to, for me to hand over to my, my colleague, Fran uh, McGinnity. So Fran is the, the lead author uh, on the study, and as, again, most of you will know, has a, a, a long history of important work uh, on uh, migrants and, and broader labor market issues. So Fran, I'm looking at the program here, you technically have about sort of half an hour, but if you could do this in sort of 20, 25 minutes, it will allow more time uh, for uh, responses and some questions. But uh, with that, I'll hand over to you then. Okay, um, Alan, thanks very much for that. Um, and thanks very much, uh, Minister Stanton. I was also very glad to hear about the, um, the Anti-Racism Committee. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone here. Um, it is a slightly different event from normal. My setting's a little different and it's definitely a bring your own coffee. And uh, we've had a few messages saying that people are missing the coffee and, and buns at the time. So, so sorry about that. It's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a COVID issue. Um, so now, um, I uh, have to say we were very excited to have this census data. We're also very grateful to the Department of, of uh, Justice and Equality for funding this program of research. Um, it's, it's on monitoring integration, but it allows us to do something uh, more ambitious uh, with census data. As Alan said, I'm going to present um, some of our findings um, on behalf of uh, the authors. Uh, we'd also like to thank the uh, CSO for, um, for preparing the data set for us and, uh, and funding its use. Okay, so let me see. I will share now. Okay, so uh, the, um, yeah, so, um, uh, this is the uh, this is the report, and it's called Origin and Integration: A Study of Migrants in the 2016 Census. Just seeing if I can move it along. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so now, um. In the report, we examined key indicators of migrant integration using the 2016 census. 
So we look at education, we look at people's self-reported language ability, um, unemployment, and whether they're, um, if they are employed, whether they're working in, in high-skilled work. So we focus on first-generation migrants and to avoid grouping migrants into regions like Asia and Africa using census data, we can examine these skills and outcomes uh, by country of birth uh, for the first time. And then with such a large sample in part two of this study, we examine differences between migrants in the labour market uh, in, in a little more detail. As I said, this is a quick summary of the findings. Um, it's, it's a large report. It's a very big data set. It's, uh, it's got everybody in Ireland in there. So uh, there's, there's a lot of findings. Uh, do read the report for more. So now, in terms of uh, just for a little context, we've got um, a background slide showing immigration, emigration and net migration into Ireland. Uh, the census took place at the blue vertical marker there in 2016. I mean, immigration peaked in red in 2007 in Ireland following uh, uh, the accession of East European countries to the EU. Um, and flows were dominated by migrants for, from Eastern Europe and Europe more generally, but they do cover a wide range of countries. In this study, we look at 117 um, different countries. As most listeners will know, um, prior to the 1990s, Ireland was um, a country largely of immigration. And you'll see there from that green dotted line that in the 1980s, but also in the um, um, uh, following the most recent recession, there was a, a, a drop in um, migration, so we had negative net migration. That's more people leaving the country than coming. Okay, so what do we look at then in this report? We look at um, third level education. We look at people's self-reported language ability. Um, the top category here in the census is, is very good. So this one, uh, this is what we take. This, this will also include excellent. It is people's self-reported language, but um, that's, um, uh, um, and, 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 and this will vary a little bit, but, but, but given that we don't ha have education on many other, uh, on almost any other uh, data sets in Ireland, it is, and we know it's uh, very important for, uh, for labour market skills, we, um, we, we, we we use this measure for unemployment. It's um, we take a self-defined principal status. That's how would you define your um, your economic status? And then for job quality, we take people in professional managerial jobs. These are um, what people might think of as good jobs. This is uh, doctors, teachers, um, engineers, uh, software developers, um, and why all this talk about. Uh, considering individual countries instead of regions, which is what we normally do. Just looking here at this pie chart, uh, census data for Asian migrants, um, we see that 22% uh, of those uh, are from India, yes, uh, and, and we've got Philippines, Pakistan and China, but actually uh, there's many from other Asian countries. We have, we have uh, 34 Asian countries in this data set, and um, we, we, uh, we, we're interested in whether differences uh, are, are um, whether we observe differences by, by country of birth. So what do we find? Um, most migrant groups uh, are more likely to hold a third level degree than Irish born. So we're not talking about predominantly low skilled migration in Ireland, though there are differences between uh, within regions, especially in, in, in Asia and Africa. And um, English proficiency, self-reported English is not surprisingly uh, much higher in countries where English is widely spoken. But um, this is uh, actually, especially in countries outside the, U the EU, um, with the exception of the UK, and uh, many of these countries are the United States, uh, India, Nigeria, the Philippines, uh, so um, it's not just within EU countries. I'm going to show a couple of slides here to give you a flavour of country of birth um, findings, but actually uh, there's, there's a lot more. There's 117 countries in the report, so you'll see that. Just uh, on education, you know, if we see 
Ireland's in the in the um, the blue dot uh, or the green dot. Sorry, uh, if we look at the you know the top five EU countries, uh, you know eighty percent of them stay in France, Switzerland, or Austria and Greece of, of them living in Ireland of third level education. But then we've got another group where they're. Um, the, the third level qualifications are lower, uh, and and in in Poland and mainly in Eastern Europe and particularly in Latvia, uh, the response. But you see there, so there's quite a big spread then uh, in, um, in 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 EU countries. Then uh, here we are on self-rated English language ability. This is uh, the rest of the world. This is uh, non-EU, not Africa and Asia. Um, and here we are, basically. Um, all uh, of of um, of those born in Ireland, uh, and then people from New Zealand. That's America, the United States, Australia, Canada. As I said, also uh, India, the Philippines, Nigeria, South Africa, and then. Uh, but then we've also got very low rates there in some um, in some East European and, and Asian countries, and also uh, and also among uh, Brazilians. And I suppose the message just from this chart, the, the countries are in blue dots. The message from this chart is mainly that um, a, it's not always the countries that have high, highly educated migrants uh, who, who are the ones with um, high English language ability. At country level, these don't always go um, hand in hand. But of course, both very important for uh, finding and and keeping a job. Looking now at, at the unemployment um, uh, findings, here's some among um, the highest and the lowest African countries. Here, of course, uh, unemployment is, is a negative outcome. This is 2016, remember now. Uh, things will be looking a little different now. Um, but uh, there's the, um, the Irish uh, self-defined unemployment rate there, the dot under, uh, under 20%. But we see uh, migrants from Somalia, Congo, Angola, um, Togo, Libya have, have very high unemployment. But there's other African migrants from, from Zambia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, who have uh, unemployment rates that are actually rather similar. Those little bars there are uh, um, to give an indication of how confident we are of those findings. We have, uh, this is, um, their um, uh, confidence intervals, the wider the bar, the smaller the group, so we can't be quite as confident here. Looking now at uh, professional managerial jobs among those who have one, uh, in, 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 and among the Asian countries there, uh, you know, 40%, um, around 40% of, of, of those born in Ireland have these kind of jobs, but I actually say for, for Indian uh, migrants, uh, more of them have the are in these high skilled jobs than in um, than those born in Ireland, but it's a it's a rather different story then for for other Asian countries. Oh, there's a there's there's a lot um, of oh sorry <laughs> there's a lot of uh, variation. Then in the second part, we start to look in a little more depth about why some migrant groups are more successful than others, and then if you think about how people come to Ireland, um, migration routes they're known as. Um, there's, there's EU migrants on the one hand, and as I said, most migrants to Ireland are from other EU countries. They're, they're free to live and work uh, in Ireland without restriction. For non-EU nationals then, there's managed migration. And, and there's different routes in here too. So some people come in seeking international protection, uh, they, they, they're uh, seeking, seeking asylum in Ireland. Um, then um, uh, there's, there's uh, work permit holders, people who come to work in uh, typically high skilled jobs and uh, in, in critical skills, particularly in the tech sector. There's quite a, a strong flow of student migration and some also come for, for family reunification. Okay, so if we consider only the foreign born uh, and shift the focus away from country of birth. Uh, we just consider uh, migrants here and distinguish EU and non-EU. And then within the non-EU, we, we estimate that we can't know why uh, people came to Ireland, what their route was, but um, 
we can, uh, so we, we have a workaround, an estimate of the likelihood that they have come to Ireland as a protection applicant, uh, uh, seeking, uh, seeking asylum or, or other protection. We base this on migrant flows from the UNHCR. And um, then we also look at uh, people's individual characteristics, like their age, their gender, their qualifications, English uh, and their ethnicity. What do we find? So we find that once we account for, for these, these individual um, characteristics that um, EU-born migrants have a lower unemployment risk um, than non-EU migrants, remember we're just focusing on migrants here, but also um, EU-born have lower um, educational attainment. Um, this is, uh, sorry, lower occupational attainment uh, than non-EU-born. So, the non-EU who come to work are often then in these highly skilled, uh, uh, critical skills jobs. Another finding is that migrants from countries with high rates of international protection applications um, have worse outcomes, especially unemployment risk uh, than others. We also know migrants' ethnicity and find that compared to white migrants, black migrants are more likely to be unemployed. But we don't find this for Asian migrants. Asian migrants are actually more likely to be in a high skill job than white migrants. So ethnicity does matter, but it also matters um, what your ethnicity is. For non-EU nationals, um, there's been a rapid rise in Irish citizenship acquisition for this group, uh, people born outside the EU. And we actually find that being an Irish citizen is associated with lower unemployment and higher occupational attainment, being in a better job. Um, so this is even after we account for people's skills and how long they've lived in Ireland. So uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting. It suggests that this group are integrating uh, somewhat better. Um, People who, um, uh, who've lived in Ireland uh, for a, a bit longer, 10 to 20 years of lower unemployment, that's what we would expect. Those with better language skills and higher educational attainment have better labour market outcomes, especially uh, being in a high skilled job. Looking at some, uh, some policy implications then, uh, the fact that we show for such a large sample of migrants, all of them living in Ireland in 2016, that English language skills play an important role, really highlights the importance of coordinated, uh, well-advertised English language provision. And in fact, in current conditions, maybe the, uh, the online delivery mode uh, would be, a, could be a way of, of uh, a, a more cost-efficient and um, effective way of migrants accessing training. Um, there's also the issue of recognition of qualifications acquired abroad. There is a system in place, but another report I was involved in last year suggests that, uh, that there are sort of soft barriers. Employers don't always know about this. Um, another important finding is that those who have come through the protection system, those who are, uh, have come to Ireland seeking asylum, may need extra support. Um, from this report, it looks like uh, they are struggling uh, in the Irish labour market and they may need, uh, they may need extra supports uh, to, to integrate and contribute to Irish society. Also, ethnic, ethnic, those ethnic group differences, that the disadvantage for the black ethnic group suggests that uh, we also need policies to monitor, prevent and, and respond to discrimination like uh, so oh, I was very pleased to hear about the anti-racism committee that uh, David Stanton just mentioned, uh, because uh, the findings do suggest that uh, even after accounting for whether you've come through the protection system, your education, your skills, uh, your, your language skills, there, there's still a, an ethnic penalty. Um, in terms of limitations, all research has limitations. There, there's only so many uh, pages you can fill. Uh, I suppose a key lesson for us is that there's some limitations of, of regional analysis, like, like using categories like, like Asia. We also got very excited about the potential of census data like this for integration research, allowing us to look more closely at, at countries. Um, 
we don't have second generation. Uh, this is currently not measured anywhere uh, in Ireland or the reasons for migration. Uh, both very important. I'm pleased to say they're soon to be uh, coming in the labour force survey. So I think that will be um, a big addition for us. Many of you are probably thinking that uh, integration is not all about uh, work and uh, education or, or, or even language. And uh, we're well aware that this study doesn't uh, tap people's sense of belonging, their identity, their social networks, who they have contact with. We, we need a migrant survey uh, for that. And uh, as Alan said at the start, uh, COVID-19, of course, was, wasn't even dreamt of in, in 2016 when this survey was conducted, but it will have a substantial impact on, on migrants and, and migration, and it's likely to be large. Migrants as workers, given the jobs they do, whether that's as, as essential workers, as carers, as healthcare workers, or, or as those um, who lost their jobs, it's going to have a very big impact on migrants as students and also those as uh, protected applicants, and, and it's very challenging for the protection process. Um, so, thank you very much for listening. Uh, the full report is, is now available on the ESRI website. Um, we try and answer some of the questions in this session, but if you have further questions, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch.